Hello there. I'm Kurt Steinbrook, pastor of Faith Lutheran Church in Wesley Chapel, Florida. And we are going through the book of Romans in this video series that we've been doing for a couple of months now. Uh, we're looking at just a few verses or sometimes even just one verse at a time and really digging in and, and trying to get everything out of Romans as we can. And there's really so much. There's so much that uh, we're being taught. And of course, then there's also the way God works through his his word to change us and to uh, bring or to give us faith and strengthen our faith and, and all these different things that he does. Uh, today, we're moving on from Romans 8 to Romans 9. So we're starting a new chapter and a new section, really, where um, chapters 6 through 8 kind of had one thought that was uh, like an overarching thought that was happening there. Chapters 9 through 11 are going to do the same type of thing as we, as Paul uh, finishes up his treatise, if you will, or his his letter uh, that goes through so many aspects of, of just how the gospel works and, uh, you know, that it is a gospel of grace through faith in Jesus Christ and then how we live out our faith. And now he turns his attention to Israel and he's going to still bring in some of these other things that we've been talking about, but he's going to look specifically to the people of uh, of God, the, the Israelites, and, uh, and what's going on with them. Are they saved? Are they not saved? And he's starting to look at that question. So we're going to look at the first three verses of chapter nine. Before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with us here in this time as we read your word and study it, that you would uh, teach us by your spirit the things that you would have us to learn through it, that you would change us, that you would uh, that you would draw us closer to you, that we would uh, grow in our faith in this time. And we just thank you for, uh, for your word and for uh, the way that you interact with us through your spirit and uh, that you aren't, we aren't just here on our own to figure things out about life. You give us your word, you give us your spirit. And uh, we thank you for that. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. All right. So let's read it and then we'll discuss it. So let me share it with you first. There we go. Okay. Romans 9, 1 to 3. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So Paul starts with, I'm speaking the truth in Christ, which is kind of an interesting thing to say. We're already halfway through the, the letter. And now he's like, no, 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 I'm being honest. I'm being honest. I'm speaking the truth here in this section. So why is he starting with this? Why is he saying, I'm, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness. The Holy Spirit bears witness about this. Well, the reality is that Paul has had a difficult relationship with uh, Israel, with the Jews, ever since his conversion. So he was, as you know, he... Uh, and originally, or I mean, he, he's a Jewish man, and he was originally a Pharisee, and he was just zealous for his his faith, zealous for the Jewish traditions, to the point that he was uh, attacking the church, and he was persecuting Christians. And then he, he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. Everything changes. And now he's the one going out and proclaiming the gospel to people, proclaiming the gospel to the Jews, and they're a lot of times not wanting anything to do with it, or at least many of them aren't, and especially the Jewish leaders. And so he's he gets beaten, he gets uh, whipped. If you remember when Jesus uh, is um, moving towards his crucifixion, they arrest him, and he's whipped with uh, a cat of nine tails, which is the type of whip that's got um, extra, like a few extra things on it, and then it's, it's got uh, barbs and things tied into it just to really... Uh, cause problems and they would do what they call the 40 minus one or 40 less one 
uh, whipping, which was 40 lashes was considered a death sentence. And so they would do 39 lashes as a, a punishment that wasn't quite to death, but you were to the, you know, basically to the edge of death. And he had that done to him five times, at least. Uh, we know this because he shares this in one of the other letters. So he's beaten, he's arrested, he's getting whipped, all these different things. So you could understand why he might be a little upset about that. Furthermore, he's known as the apostle that was called to the Gentiles. And so he's uh, bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Oftentimes he still starts in the synagogue, but then he goes out and he's uh, trying to reach people outside of the Jewish uh, people. And so some people uh, may have thought he's he's kind of turned against the Jews, that he's he would not want anything to do with them or that he would not care very much for them. And so he starts with this. He's about to talk about how much he he loves them, how much he uh, suffers in his heart for the fact that they aren't receiving the Messiah that was promised to them. Um, and he wants to make it clear. I'm, I'm not lying about this. I'm not just saying this. I really, really deeply care about them. Um, and so that's that's why this this kind of interesting start to this section, even though it's middle, they, they don't think that Paul is a liar. But now he's going to talk about something where maybe some of them would have been like, eh, does he really think that about the Jews saying yes? Not only do I say it, but the Holy Spirit is bearing witness with me. So this is absolutely true. So what is he saying? He's saying that he has great sorrow and unce unceasing anguish in his heart uh, because of the state of the Jews who have rejected Jesus, their promised Messiah. He knows what this means. He knows that they are rejecting salvation, and he wants them to be saved. He wants them to know the Messiah that they've been waiting for, that they're still waiting for because they're missing Jesus Christ, who was the Messiah. And so it breaks his heart. You know, it breaks his heart. He is sincerely bothered by it, uh, deeply bothered by it, to the point where he says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Right. So he's saying, no, I, I could wish it really, the word there really should probably be pray for the translation. I could pray that I myself were accursed. In other words, I could ask God to cut me off if, you know, in order to bring all of them in that I would, he would sacrifice, he would, he would be willing to suffer eternal condemnation for them. But of course, he says, I could wish that, I would wish that, but he knows that it wouldn't work. That's not how things go. That the only Christ, only Jesus could, and of course did, give himself for their salvation. They have to receive it. They have to receive it. He can't take their their punishment for them um christ already did that but they have to still receive it in faith and so but he's expressing the desire that he has uh for his as he said his brothers his kinsmen according to the flesh and that's the jewish people they're, and they're literally their family you know they're their friends they're people that he grew up with their neighbors they're people that he knows you know, people who taught him, people who he may have taught. You know, so this isn't like just some outsider looking in and saying, oh, I wish that these people were, were going to be saved. He, he knows a lot of these people, and it, it breaks his heart. Paul understands the stark reality that outside of Christ, there is no salvation. And I think this is a good passage for us to also reflect on ourselves and say, do we understand that reality? Do we really understand that? Do we, do we, because we do bear this burden, but do we bear it in this way? You know, our, our neighbors, family members, coworkers, uh, students, teachers, friends, for those who, who don't know Jesus, for those who don't believe they're, walking towards hell right there they are walking towards condemnation and it should break our hearts it should bother us 
right? If they are not in Christ, they stand condemned in their sins. Now, our society will will say, no, 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 we should coexist. We shouldn't try to force our beliefs on others. That would be that would be wrong. But that's I mean, it's a lie. It's and it, it's ridiculous. It's it's horrible in what it what it means. If you were to think about it this way, um, if you saw people being harmed and uh, being taken advantage of, oppressed, and you know, you're like, we need to do something about this. And then someone came along and said, "Well, what are you?" You, you shouldn't do anything about that. You know, why why should you put your your ways onto them? You know, you should coexist with them. You're like, yeah, but they're they're suffering. They're they're being taken advantage of. They're you know, they're something bad is going to happen to them. But you should coexist. Right? That's not that's not okay. That's not okay. People are dying, people are uh are being condemned to hell. There's because they're staying in their sin because they're they're not receiving Christ and it should it should bother us. It's something that we should uh, you know that we should want to to help with that we should want to share that gospel message with people and to so that they can they can hear it right that they we can be a a witness to the truth of Jesus Christ and have the Spirit God willing. Uh, you know, working in their hearts as he he always does, but you know, hopefully they don't resist and and uh, push him away. But you know, we we share the gospel and then let the Holy Spirit do His work uh, to call people into salvation. Just continue to pray for them. And so, I want to encourage you today, um, and for all the days after. Right, I want to encourage you to pray and to make this a daily prayer. To, to pray that God would would put that burden in your heart and in your mind, just like Paul had. To pray that it would bother, that you wouldn't be able to turn a blind eye to, you know, a neighbor or a coworker or whomever that doesn't know Christ. That you would feel compelled to share the gospel with. Them. That you wouldn't be satisfied just to let people go without hearing the gospel. And then pray for the people. Pray for the people in your life who who don't know Jesus. Pray for them by name. You know, make a list. And just every day, I'm going to be praying for these people and then looking for those opportunities to share the gospel with them. Pray for those opportunities. Pray that God would create those opportunities and then give you the boldness, you know, the wisdom to see it and then the boldness to speak and to share the gospel in those, those moments. And that, that the Holy Spirit would give you the words to say. And a lot of times we're afraid that we're going to say something wrong. But um, you know, don't let that fear stop you. Don't let the fear stop you. You can share a very simple gospel message with people. That Jesus, you know, we're all created by God. We've sinned. We've turned away from God. And that, the, you know, the consequence of that is death. The wages of sin is death. But Jesus took that price for us. He died on the cross. So that we could be forgiven and saved. And now, if we believe in him, we have salvation. That's the gospel. And we can share that with people. Um, it's you, know, you don't have to make it convoluted or very complicated. It can be simple. So, I want to encourage you to pray that. To pray every day. Both for the burden, as well as for the people. For the opportunities and the boldness to speak the words to say. And then to do it. So let's let's end with that time of prayer. Okay, so let's do that right now. So if you would join with me in prayer, let's close with that. Heavenly Father, there are people that we know who don't know you. People that we know who are still uh, in their sin. And because of that, they face condemnation. But Lord, you sent your son to die for them, for us and for them. And Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts and our minds, that we would not be satisfied to just live life and ignore the people around us who don't know you. 
or to just be satisfied to coexist, even though we know where they're headed, but rather that we would have a burden, that we would feel compelled to speak, that we would feel compelled to pray as we're doing that. And Lord, we pray for those people whom we know. And we'll take a minute here um, and I'll encourage you at home to, to just take a minute and think about some of the people that you know, who you, either you know they don't know Jesus, or maybe you're not sure, and to pray for them right now, by name. Lord, we pray that you would work in these people's hearts, that you would uh, provide us opportunities to share the gospel, that you would give us the words to say in those moments, that you would send other people as well to share the gospel, that they would keep hearing it, and that when they hear your word, that by the power of your spirit, they would receive it in faith, that they would come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, we pray this today, and we pray this every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, keep praying, keep lifting these people up in prayer, keep looking for those opportunities to share the gospel, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. Uh, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have a great day.